And so that's what this model is communicating. A deletion downstream of the gene does not affect the gene directly, but it keeps it from being turned on. And so I don't think I can do this in white. Nope. So you'll have a black cross on a black background, which you can't see. And so, to recap this part of the talk, aniridia is typically caused by loss of PAC6 function, and by this I mean at the protein level. PAC6 function can be lost by mutations in the PAC6, by mutations within the gene that cause a loss of a protein function. These are the nonsense mutations, the splicing mutations, and all of those sorts of things. There can be chromosomal rearrangements or deletions that take that disrupt or remove the PAC6 gene entirely or in part. These would be examples of Wagner syndrome and also the patients that I just uh, talked to you about that had rearrangements downstream of PAC6. There can be other types of mutations that disrupt regulatory regions that uh, we don't know about. Uh, we suspect that there is at least one patient that has a rearrangement three prime to the gene. And then theoretically, there are chromosomal rearrangements that can turn off PAC6 expression, but it does it just sort of uh, non-specifically. So it's as if, um, sorry, back up and give you an analogy. Chromosomal rearrangements that disrupt regulatory regions, this third bullet point, uh, can be thought of as sort of a master circuit breaker in your house. And so if the master circuit breaker is broken, then the gene can never turn on, just as if, no, as if no power was delivered to your house. This other example we know exists in certain types of genetic disorders, uh, thalassemias and certain blood disorders. And so we know that it can occur in, the, in a person, but we can't show that it occurs for PAC6, but we can't rule it out. In this case, it would be equivalent to having the power plant go out somewhere. Uh, and so you lose power to your house, but it's not because your house is, has a problem, but it's because there's a problem somewhere else. So we don't have any evidence that this can occur yet, but we can't rule it out either. And so, now we come back to the question, do all aneritics have mutations in PAC6? And the answer is perhaps. A lot of this comes down to how or how aniridia is diagnosed. And so we know that a large number of people that have sort of classically defined aniridia or aniridia that it presents in a, an expected way are going to have a mutation that affects PAC6. But I suspect that patients that don't have a normal presentation of, PAC, of aniridia, for example, somebody that might have an iris defect, um, could certainly have a mutation in another gene. And so genes that are potentially associated with an aniridia phenotype include FOXC1, 1, PIDX3, and CMAF. There are a couple others, um, but I'm not at liberty to discuss them. I'm not at liberty to discuss them. And so why would these genes give rise to an aniridia-like phenotype? The FOXC1 transcription factor is expressed in the periocular mesenchyme, and so those are the pink cells or the red petal cells that we saw earlier in eye development. And so this gene is expressed in those migrating cells and can affect the development of those cells. And so we know for a fact that mutations in this gene cause eye abnormalities, including iris hypoplasia. So now you can see the tie to aniridia, primary congenital glaucoma, um, and axenfeld rieger syndrome. Similarly, mutations in PIDX3, uh, which is involved in lens formation, are associated with congenital cataracts and also some anterior segment uh, dysgenesis, sort of uh, an amorphous uh, category, but it can affect iris development, it can affect uh, ciliary body, and it often it can also be implicated in glaucoma, although very rarely. So we have a transcription factor that a mutation in PIDX3 can give 
give rise to, again, sort of an iris defect or a defect that can be, uh, that can have an appearance of aniridia. And last but not least, CMAF is a large family of transcription factors. The CMAF gene is controlled by PAC6, and we know that it's involved in lens development. So mutations in CMAF often give rise to congenital cataracts and may, in fact, affect other parts of anterior eye development as well. And so I think that you can already see that simply looking at these three genes, um, all of which can affect iris or uh, lens development, can give rise to an eye phenotype that is similar in some sense to what you might find in aniridia, but not a carbon copy. So here's Axenfeld Rieger. Um, this is a Peter's anomaly, but uh, it can also, uh, so there's a couple other genes that can give rise to a corneal defect that can be interpreted as Peter's. And then, of course, cataract uh, occurs in several different gene mutations. And so what discriminates uh, an aniridic, a pac 6 type mutation that gives rise to aniridia from a mutation in one of these other genes? And the answer is it's a hard thing to know until we actually go in and begin sequencing PAC6. What sets PAC6 apart from all of those other genes is that it is expressed in all parts of the eye. And so now what you're looking at is a section for a developing mass embryo. The cornea is the corneal epithelial, or the outer layer is this bit that I just marked in uh, red. The corneal stroma is this part right here. So this is getting coming for the migra migrating neural crest that we showed as little red petals. This is the developing retinal pigmented epithelium, the developing retina, and of course the developing lens. So you can see that PAC6 is expressed in the corneal epithelium the retinal pigmented epithelium, the developing retina, the ciliary body, and the lens. And so PAC6 is expressed in all of these cells, and so mutations in PAC6 is going to affect the development of all of these cells. In contrast, I'm sorry, I didn't explain what you're looking at. So you're seeing the actual PAC6 protein from a mouse is shown in red. So these cells in red are actually cells that are expressing the native PAC6 protein. And then the cells in green are cells that we created in the laboratory to help us see where PAC6 is expressed. And so what you're looking for is red plus green. And because they're in slightly different locations, you get red or a yellowish color with a green surround. Uh, where they significantly overlap, you get yellow, as in here in the ciliary body. So back to the, uh, what I started with. So what sets PAC6 apart and an aniridic that has a PAC6 mutation apart from other types of eye defects that can give rise to iris, that can give rise to defects in the iris, the ciliary body, or the cornea, is where the gene is expressed. PIDX3 and FOXC1 are both expressed in cells that give rise to the corneal stroma, ciliary body, and the developing iris, which isn't here yet. And so mutations in those cells are going to affect specifically those parts of the eye, but they may not affect other parts like the retina or other parts of the brain or the pancreas, where we know that PAC6 has a role. So that diagnosis is really, really important in helping us understand whether a child or a person has likely has a mutation in PAC6 or somewhere else. Now, are there any questions about that before we move on to uh, a different topic altogether? Lacey, go ahead. Lacey, you can press your talk button. Okay, Lacey's. Let's continue, Dr. Lauderdale, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, one 
of the questions that I often get is, can we use any existing technology to, uh, to repair an iridia at the cellular level? And the answer is, to some degree. And so one of the things that my lab is working on is to develop therapies that we can use to treat, and I don't have the right eye, so let me quickly scan up here for a second. So one of the things that my lab is working on are ways that we can go in and begin to repair the cornea uh, specifically and also treat glaucoma. So those are parts of the eye that we feel are experimentally amenable and therapeutically amenable to treating um, some of the uh, problems with aniridia. So basically what we're trying to do is to repair the cornea uh, and parts of the eye that are involved in glaucoma. Now, many of you know that uh, there are some eye disorders which are currently being treated uh, using gene therapy. And so a question that I get all the time is why can't we just use the same approach to produce relievers to genital amaurosis uh, to treat aniridia. And so the first thing that, and so let's talk a little bit about Libras. So Libras is um, typically characterized externally by nystagmus, this involuntary eye movement, vision loss or blindness, and all of this has to do with photoreceptors. So if the fovea, if the cones in the fovea don't form properly, then the body doesn't have any place to put the image and it starts searching. It begins this random search pattern to try to find the right point. And that's what gives rise to nystagmus. So if the fovea isn't functioning, then it often leads to this involuntary eye movement. Now, the other thing that happens in the fovea, of course, is that since that's the part where we have the highest visual acuity, loss of function in the fovea leads to a decrease in vision. Um, and if it's widespread enough and includes the periphery, the rods as well, then of course blindness can result. Now there are currently 11 recognized types of Leber's congenital amaurosis, and we think that, they, that there are 14 different genes that can give rise to these 11 different types. Now the reason that there are more genes than types is because some of these genes act in the same pathway. And so if you break the pathway upstream or downstream, you get the same result. Of the types of congenital uh, amaurosis, which, is, which are best known, RPE65 is probably the best recognized gene. RPE65 stands for retinal pigmented epithelium. It encodes for a protein that can come in two flavors. The membrane-associated form of the protein acts as a chaperone for, a, for retinal esters, and we'll see that in a moment which allows them to enter into the visual cycle and it's necessary for vision, okay? The soluble form of RPE65 is a chaperone for vitamin A. And so both, uh, both the processing to 11 cis retinal and vitamin A are important for rod and cone function. And so that's really a really important distinction uh, between Libers, the, the RPE65 form of Libers, and and iridia. And so now we need to go back to the eye 